Uh, as Peg said, I am working on a novel. I've been working on it in earnest uh, for about five years, uh, which uh, they tell me is not so long for a novel. I guess novel writing is sort of like geologic time. You know, it, it's a, the five years isn't that long. But it, to me, it does seem like it's, it's taken a while. Um, in my head, I give the project little names, like sometimes I call it the never-ending story. Um, other times I call it Long Day's Journey and Tonight. Um, but the actual working title of the novel is uh, The Letter Writer. And I'm just going to read a short section from the beginning. This is set in Korea in 1950. 300 kilometers south of Pyongyang, in the foothills outside the South Korean town of Masan, Ahn Young Gun hunched over an old school desk, writing by the coveted light of an electric bulb. Five finished letters sat in a neat stack in front of him, enveloped and addressed. He began the sixth. He formed his letters quickly, stopping only to recheck the spelling of the sponsor's name from a list to his right. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Kramer. As for the rest, he was impatient to get on with it. A large dilapidated dictionary sat on his desk, but he did not need it now. Each letter contained the same message. Gratitude to the sponsor and the Lord, references to the war, the hardship of orphanage life. He wanted to finish and get to the next letter, the one he had saved for last. He usually had a quiet pride in his penmanship of English letters, the deliberate evenness of his cursive lines. Now he wrote quickly, being only mindful enough not to smudge the ink. The desk had been made for a child, and though he was small for his 17 years, he had to fold his legs to fit. He felt the cold metal bar under the desk press into the tops of his knees. A faded quilt covered his thin shoulders, and a roughly knit cap was pulled low enough to cover his forehead and ears. The room had no heat, but when he wrote, he rarely felt the cold. Hello, how are you? I am fine. He began all his letters the same way, remembering the recitation from the missionary school where he had learned his English. He could still hear the hollow tapping on the wood floor as Miss Craig, the lady missionary, stepped up and down the aisle in her stiff, square-heeled shoes. This is an apple. This is an automobile. Like the desk, his clothes were too small for him, his neck and arms jutting out from the frayed edges of both collar and cuff. Thick, blend, black rim spectacles dominated his delicate features. We thank the Lord for your good kindness. The war is very bad. From the same list, he checked the corresponding orphan's name, Song Bong Su, and signed the letter accordingly. This sponsor had mentioned sending something. What was it? A hat. He made a mental note to mention it to the boy, who would be pleased almost as much as if he had actually received it. He waved the paper to dry the ink, folded the letter, and slipped it in its envelope. He picked up a clean sheet of writing paper, the last one. He looked again at the photo that the sponsor had enclosed with the note, written in American-style handwriting, with all the letters slanting heavily to the right. The sponsors occasionally sent photos, the family, the house, the dog that looked as fat as the children. This photo was different. A woman, he presumed her to be the letter writer, Mrs. Hope Longfield of Michigan, USA, stood at the shore. Though her title indicated that she was married, she stood alone. The sun shone behind her, obscuring her features. The wind whipped her unbound hair across her face and forced her skirt to cling to her legs. She stood too much in shadow for him to see her clearly, but he felt that if he could have seen it, her expression, despite her jaunty posture, would have been an unhappy one. The corner of the photograph was defective, a blank splotch cut into the picture like a second sun. He would have been the first to admit that he knew nothing of American tastes and manners. Even so, he felt the oddness of the correspondence from the stranger. The first part of the letter was unremarkable, full of perfunctory greetings, the weather, sympathy over news of the war. Then this. I live on a quiet street lined with oaks, she had written. The trees shade the lane in summer and stand as sentinels in winter. Now their bare arms reach out to me. It had taken him one long hour to work through those few sentences. It helped when he realized that she was not using sentinel to me, as it said in his dictionary, a soldier standing guard. His breath had quickened. It was meant to be poetic. Mrs. Hope Longfield had, had addressed her letter to Hyam, the object of her sponsorship. 
The letter he was writing now was presumed to be coming from the 12-year-old orphan. This only made Youngin feel more at a loss. Hyon herself was extremely shy. In Youngin's weeks at the orphanage, she had not exchanged even a single greeting with her. How could he represent such a simple girl to her obviously complicated benefactor? It's a good life, the letter continued, though I still wait for that blessing which will confer upon me the most welcome and resounding honor, mother. He had worked on that sentence for most of the second afternoon before giving up. That sentence was as obscure as the face in the photograph. What kind of person would write such a difficult letter? Hello, how are you? I am fine. He thanked her. He assured her that the money would be used for a new winter coat. All the children were grateful for their American sponsors. Thank you for the photograph, he continued after some thought. It is good. Actually, the quality was rather poor, and for the first time it occurred to him that she might have sent it because she was unwilling to part with anything better. He frowned but quickly dismissed the thought. She was not, he felt, that kind of person. He stared at what he had written, dissatisfied at having produced such a conventional response. Where was the deeper sentiment? His limitations with English vexed him. Had he the words, he thought, he would tell her the best things about Korea. He would write about how each of the four seasons articulated themselves on the slope of the foothills, the dogwood in spring, the maple in autumn. He would describe pools of water so clear that you could see the flash of sun reflecting on the scales of the fish below. But he did not have the words, not in English. He had forgotten about the cold. Now he stretched his cramped fingers before writing again. In Korea, it is winter. The trees look so beautiful. He sighed. How poorly his feelings translated to the page. At least he hoped she would appreciate the way he also wrote the trees. He stopped writing to check the spelling of the word beautiful. He imagined the American woman with loosened hair, sitting in her square house, reading his letter. Perhaps she would reread it after her dinner of meat and boiled and smashed potatoes. Perhaps she would know, as he did, that she was hearing from the kindred spirit. Yes.